Welcome to Chapter 17, where we talk about the endocrine system. You're either going to love this chapter or you're going to hate it. There doesn't seem to be any in-between. It's complicated. It's intricate. Things depend on other things. There's pathways. All kinds of interactions. So you can't just really sit down and just memorize independent facts. So if you're one of those people who like to make flashcards, you can try, but you're going to find it's a little more complicated in this particular chapter. So that being said, I love the endocrine system. I find it endlessly fascinating, and they're constantly finding new hormones. So I'm still learning about new stuff, and I'll throw some of it in that is so new that it isn't even in your textbook. So... We have chemicals that run around in our body that cause our different glands and organs to do various things. If you're talking about the nervous system, we use neurotransmitters. And if you're talking about the rest of the body, we pretty much use hormones. Now, you can have locally acting hormones, and you can have hormones that work throughout the entire body. For example, growth hormone. And uh, one of the things that this chapter says it's going to talk about endocrine dysfunctions, but it really only talks about uh, diabetes pretty much. So I'm going to throw a few in. Here is a beautiful woman who developed a tumor that started secreting too much growth hormone. Now, if you do this before puberty, you'll grow into a giant. But if you do it after puberty, which is what this woman did, then you get a condition called acromegaly. And this is what she ended up looking like. Your long bones have fused, but you can still put bone in your face, and you can still put it in your hands. So this is what she looked like as she progressed, and the tumor kept making growth hormone, and then this is what she ended up looking like. Now, this is going to put stress on your heart, so I don't know, I can't say for sure, but I'm going to guess that this person probably died of a heart attack. So she went from looking like that to looking like that. And this is what happens if you don't have enough growth hormone. This is Tom Thumb. And as far as I know, he's the world's smallest man. He passed away when his kidneys failed when he was in his early 30s. So this is lack of growth hormone. This person obviously made too much growth hormone before their long bones had set in the epiphyseal plates. So he continued to grow taller and taller and taller until finally he went uh, past puberty and his epiphyseal plates sealed. Interestingly enough, some of the neurotransmitters can act as hormones. So depending on how they're secreted, where they're secreted, whether they make it into the bloodstream, determines whether we call it a neurotransmitter or a hormone. And the classic one that everybody always thinks about is epinephrine which in America we call adrenaline. So you can have adrenaline rush throughout your whole body that causes all kinds of things to happen, or you can have it released in the synapse in a, a, a nerve, and you just have an action from that nerve to across the synapse. So you don't have the whole body reaction. So if it was released from a nerve, then we would call it a neurotransmitter, but if it is released say, from the adrenal glands, then we call it a uh, uh, hormone. There are four major ways the cells can talk to each other. If they're next to each other, then they can have what they call gap junctions. So it's almost like you've stuck a piece of spaghetti that's hollow from one cell membrane to the other cell membrane. So stuff that's inside of one cell can just go through this tube and end up on the other side. So when you need cells to talk to each other quickly, you're going to have these gap junctions. 
A second way cells can talk to each other is through a synaptic cleft. So here is the end of an axon. It's called a bouton, which is kind of fun to say, bouton. And it has neurotransmitters in these little vesicles, these little bags, and it pushes them over to the edge whenever there's a signal that comes through. And the neurotransmitter is dumped out into the synaptic cleft, this gap area right here. And it goes across and it touches a receptor on the next thing. Now, this could be a gland, this could be another nerve, it could be a muscle. So something has a receptor that can understand and can accept these neurotransmitters. Now this is very localized, like the gap junction is from one cell to another cell. This one, from one cell to an effector, like a gland, a nerve, or a muscle. Paracrine acting chemicals are secreted into tissues and they affect nearby cells. So, paracrine nearby. But hormones are endocrine, and they go everywhere in the body. But they only react to cells that have receptors to invite them in. We have some glands that secrete chemicals, but they do it through a duct. And so we call them the exocrine glands. So, a classic example would be saliva. Then we have those that are endocrine, and they don't have a duct. They literally just squirt it out of the cell. A long time ago, I was looking at breast tissue and breast cancer and prolactin and various hormones, and um, I took this picture myself with the electron microscope of a breast cell, and I was just lucky enough to catch it in the act of doing exocytosis. So it had one of those bags full of prolactin. It pushed to the surface, and you can see it spilling out from the surface. So this is an endocrine cell, and it's going to release its prolactin, and it's going to go throughout the body and react anywhere that there's a receptor for prolactin. In most textbooks, you'll look up that prolactin is what makes women make milk, and they secrete it whenever they are pregnant. But men make prolactin too, and men don't nurse babies. So obviously prolactin has a lot more functions in the body than just to make milk in pregnant women. And one of the interesting things that I discovered when I was playing around with breast tissues is that morphine goes into the body through a prolactin receptor. So if you stop and think about it, morphine is part of a plant. So why would we have receptors in our body for a plant substance? Well, it just so happens that the prolactin can fit into this receptor and so can the morphine. So the way I discovered this was because women who are breastfeeding are in a lot of pain when they go to have any kind of um, surgery or whatever where you have to have prolactin or excuse me morphine for pain relief because they already have prolactin sitting in the receptors the morphine doesn't have anywhere to go so it doesn't have any effect and so the woman ends up uh, not getting relief from a morphine injection. So that was one of the more interesting discoveries that I made, oh gosh, back in the 80s. So this slide compares and contrasts the nervous system and the endocrine system. So the nervous uh, reacts in milliseconds. So you take a second and divide it up into a thousand pieces. It's that fast. It's like a thousandth of a second. And it stops quickly because you have enzymes that go in the synapse and either reuptake or break down the neurotransmitter. In the case of the endocrine system, it reacts very slowly. It may take minutes, days, weeks for the effect. 
Obviously, when I showed you the pictures of acromegaly, that didn't happen overnight. That took a long time and a continuous uh, secretion of hormone to cause it to the bones to spread out like that. In nervous, you adapt quickly. So you fatigue, you stop having an effect over time. But with the endocrine system, the response will continue and continue. So you adapt slowly, if at all. And again, the nervous is targeted specific. It'll be an organ, a muscle, or another nerve. The endocrine can be everywhere. And it can affect many, many organs. All right, so here's some of the organs. You have the hypothalamus. Above that, you have the pineal gland or pineal gland, depending on which way you want to pronounce it. And you have the pituitary. Then you come down, you have the thyroid. You have the thymus. And you have, if you look on top of the kidneys, it looks like somebody parked a piece of chewing gum on top of the kidneys. And that's your adrenal glands. So you have adrenal glands on top, like a little hat on top of your kidneys. Your pancreas makes hormones and enzymes and all kinds of things. And one of the things that they discovered, uh, unfortunately, after they killed a bunch of people, was on the underside, on the side facing the trachea, you have parathyroids. So here they've, they've kind of colored them in in yellow to show you. They, they control calcium in your body. And if you don't have control over your calcium, then you're, you're dead. So they would take the thyroid out, give them replacement thyroid hormone, and they died anyway within a few days. And they couldn't figure it out until they flipped the thyroid over and said, oh, look, there's these four little dots. Wonder what they do. The most famous of all of the hormones, of course, are the testosterone, which a man secretes from his testicles, and the uh, estrogen that women make from their ovaries. And I always have to stop every time I see this picture and laugh because I don't know what the artist was trying to do, but honest to goodness, it looks like the guy has a flashlight instead of male equipment. I mentioned epinephrine, which we call adrenaline, as working like a hormone and a neurotransmitter both. And here's a few more, norepinephrine or noradrenaline, dopamine, and antidiuretic hormone. So it's kind of interesting about antidiuretic hormone because there was a bunch of people who were studying antidiuretic hormone and the, it stops you from peeing out your water. Anti means against. Diuretic means pee, so it stops peeing, hormone. And somebody else was studying a vasopressin, which is, uh, uh, affects the blood pressure. And when they looked at it, they were both studying the same thing. But, so it has different effects, depending on where it is secreted. As we get further into the chapter, we're actually going to find that some neurotransmitters affect glands and cause them to secrete hormones, and some hormones can affect neurons and turn the neurons on and off. So there, it's a symbiotic relationship going on there. Just to make things even more confusing than they already were, we now have some hormones that are released in an inactive form then they go to another cell, and that cell has an enzyme that converts the hormone into an active form. A quick picture showing you the difference between the nervous and the endocrine system. Here's the dendrites coming in. There's the cell body of a neuron. Here's the axon taking the impulse away. You get to the end, you get to the little bouton that have the little bags of neurotransmitter. It releases the neurotransmitter, then it stimulates cells. 
Down here, we have these cells making hormones, and they're doing exocytosis. They're secreting the hormone. And nearby, you have capillaries that pick the hormone up and carry it into the bloodstream. So let's look at this picture and see if this is going to help us orient ourselves inside the brain to look at the master uh, glands of the endocrine system, the ones that control the most stuff. So we'll start with one that I find kind of interesting, uh, the pineal body, the pineal gland, or pineal gland, depending on which way you want to pronounce it, and it makes melatonin. So it sets your circadian rhythm in your body. And one of the things that I did before I came to America, back to America in uh, 2014, was I flew all over the world. And I had jet lag so badly. And then someone else who did a lot of traveling like I did said, if you take melatonin, which is the hormone made by the uh, pineal gland or pineal gland, then it will reset your biological clock. It'll reset your, your time. And that was a lifesaver. So I got, I, I didn't have a problem with jet lag. And people were always amazed. So especially if you're going from Japan to America, it's a 12-hour time difference. So when everyone else in America is sitting down for lunch, everyone in Japan is going to sleep because it's midnight. So that's really hard to fly and then sometimes it would take like half a day to fly and then a day and a half to come back because you were changing time zones, literally. You, you were flying. So anyway, you can sit down and figure it out if you want to. This is responsible for what a lot of you are feeling right now. It just seems like winter will not give up. And the days got really short over winter, and it got really dark early. And you didn't feel like going outside and getting any sunshine. And a lot of times there wasn't any sunshine. It was overcast and dark and gloomy. So uh, the pineal body, or the pineal gland, is the one that makes the hormone. And it needs sunlight in order to do that. So a lot of people get sad in the winter, and that's short for seasonal affective disorder. So to get around that, you can install a full-spectrum light in your house and just make sure that you sit in a room with a full-spectrum light when the sun goes down so you're not sitting in the dark all the time. And you can trick, trick your body. Uh, some people just take hormones. Uh, the you can you can get melatonin over the counter at any drugstore grocery store it's over there so that's kind of interesting now this part right here okay let's orient ourselves here's your spinal column you're coming up and here is the um, the brain stem this is the the primitive brain in this area right here and this is the thalamus right here. This is a corpus callosum. This is the thing that connects the two halves of the brain. So if you can orient yourself with the corpus callosum and the thalamus, then underneath the thalamus is the hypothalamus. Hypo. So hypo means below. Like a hypodermic needle goes below your skin, below your dermis, hypodermic. So hypothalamus. And then you can't see here because they've taken the skull and the eyes and things away, but you've got your eyes and you've got the nerves that come from the eyes and they go between the pituitary and the hypothalamus. So this is called an infundibular stalk. That's a nice big mouthful. And the pituitary and the hypothalamus talk to each other in part through that stalk, but not completely. So we'll talk about that in just a second. But one of the first things that you may notice if you have a problem with your hypothalamus or if you have a problem with your pituitary is you stop being able to see correctly. 
So your vision is impaired. And it's because the swelling of either one of these will push on the optic chiasm. So the chiasm is where it splits off and goes off from one eye to the other eye or comes in from one eye. So you've got an optic nerve in the right eye, an optic nerve in the left eye. They come together, they join, and they go back into the brain. So depending on which direction you're looking. Uh, so the chiasm is the joining place, and it just happens to be in this vicinity right here. So you have an early indicator of problems, in case you didn't notice the weird hormonal effects that you were getting. Hopefully you remember from Anatomy 1 that anything in the front of the body is called anterior and anything in the back of the body is posterior. So the pituitary has a front part and a back part and they do two completely different methods of distributing hormones. So that's going to be kind of interesting. So our outcomes that we want to do is learn how the hypothalamus and pituitary interact with each other and name all the hormones that are produced by the anterior pituitary, all of those that are produced by the posterior pituitary or released by the posterior pituitary, and the ones that are made by the hypothalamus. And you want to know the functions of each one. Now, those of you who like flashcards, this is a perfect time to make yourself a set of flashcards. Or if you want to save yourself some time, just go on to Quizlet, Q-U-I-Z-L-E-T, and somebody will have already made flashcards of all the pituitary hormones and all the hypothalamic hormones. And then you need to know how the pituitary is controlled by the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is like the boss, and it tells the pituitary, turn on, turn off, make this, don't make that. The hypothalamus is very, very primitive. It's very, very old. It is partly responsible for maintaining the water balance in your body, how much you pee, how much you retain. Your body temperature a lot of times people are walking around now in this time of COVID and they've got the little gun that they're shooting you at the forehead and finding out what your temperature is. And a lot of people, their temperature is normally around 96 if you take their, your temperature that way. So if they ever registered 98, they'd actually be running a fever. But they don't take that into account. They're just looking for anybody that's running a fever over 101. And then they assume that they've got COVID and they send them home. And this is near and dear to our heart. Our sex drive is controlled by the hypothalamus. And then, of course, having a baby is controlled by that. So some of the more important primitive things that we do are controlled by the hypothalamus. And I'm going to put in a plug right now for a book that I read that did such a good job talking about Oddly enough, the hypothalamus. People who die of a cocaine overdose a lot of times have extremely high body temperatures. So I was Googling it to see how high it could go. And this says it can go to 120 degrees, but I've never heard of that before. I do know that I've had students in the past who've talked about picking up an overdose person and they take the temperature and their temperature is like 108, 109. So you know that when you run a fever, you're, you feel like it's really, really high if it's 103 or 104. And if you go all the way to 105, you can start having seizures. So obviously if you try to go too high. So cocaine is acting on the hypothalamus and it is changing the temperature of your body. So one of my students came up to me and he said, oh my goodness, it is so hard. He says, I really like your class, but the latest cookbook just came out. And so I actually was up all night long reading the cookbook. And I just kind of looked at him and I thought, wow. I thought I was a nerd, but to stay awake all night reading a cookbook. So I didn't say any of that, but it must have been on my face because he goes, oh. 
Do you not know about Robin Cook? He writes like the best books about medicine and things like that. And I was like, oh, really? And so I discovered Robin Cook. And now I've stayed up all night reading cookbooks too. And one of them, Blind Sight, he always starts at the beginning of his book with a prologue. And he, he tells what's going on inside the body. So here is where this guy named Duncan gets an overdose and it tells exactly what happens to him. That, that he's choking, he's vomiting, his temperature is going up and he tries to go into the shower and cool himself off. So I'll not tell you what the story is about or why he was overdosed or whether he's going to live or not. But anyway, uh, the name of this particular book is called Blind Sight. The pituitary is about the size and shape of a kidney bean, so it's really small. But it is so incredibly important that your skull actually has a bony pocket to protect it. So if you go into the sphenoid bone of the skull, there's this pocket called the cella tersica, and that's where this little pituitary sits down. So here's the cella tersica, and you can just kind of imagine that little kidney bean hanging down here from an infundibular stalk, and the hypothalamus being above it. And then you can kind of see the optic. Here's your nose. You can see the optic nerve that would come down and cross through there on its way to the occipital lobe of the brain. Here's your ear. So that'll kind of orient you. And interestingly enough, if they want to do surgery on your pituitary, instead of cracking your skull and going in and going through the frontal lobe and on down, is you just go up their nose. You can just go in their nose right there. Or you can go up through the upper gums and go that direction and get to the pituitary. So you don't have to crack the skull to get into uh, work on the pituitary. And they can't leave good well enough alone. So they've named the front part of the pituitary the adenohypophysis, and they've named the posterior pituitary the neurohypophysis. So the front part is a glandular secreting part and the posterior is actually the nerve endings. It's the, it's the axon endings coming from the hypothalamus. So it's kind of neat. If you take a class in uh, embryology, you'll learn about the origin of the different tissues. But this is kind of showing you what you look like with your tail and your little flippers and your gills back before you started looking like you do now. And you can see this fold right here coming down of nervous tissue. And that's going to end up being the neurohypophysis or the back, the posterior, of the pituitary. And then you have this other tissue. Here's your throat. The pharynx is your throat. You have this other tissue that's going to form into this glandular uh, secreting tissue, which is the anterior lobe of the pituitary are the adenohypophysis. If you remember studying the circulatory system, you know that arteries branch out into arterioles and then they branch out into capillaries and then the capillaries reform into veins. So that's the way it normally goes. But in the case of a portal system, then you actually have two capillary beds. So here we have the artery coming in, the arteriole, and it branches off into these capillaries. So here's the hypothalamus right here, and it's going to secrete hormones. And they're going to get picked up by this set of capillaries, and it's going to carry it down here to this set of capillaries where it's going to release the hormone and it's going to tell the anterior pituitary or the adenohypophysis what to do. 
So you have two capillary beds. So here comes the arteries coming in. You are releasing a hormone from the hypothalamus into the bloodstream, into the capillary bed, down past the infundibular stalk, down to the bottom, to the front part of the pituitary, where it causes hormones to be released or not released, depending on what the hypothalamus tells it to do. And then you go on to the vein, and then you go on to the rest of the body. So this is called a portal system when you have two capillary beds. So it picks up stuff here, and instead of carrying it through the whole body, it just carries down here and dumps it off. You need to spend quite some time on this particular slide because it's giving you some uh, information. You have the hypothalamus talking to the front, the anterior portion of the pituitary, and the hormones that the hypothalamus is releasing are gonadotropin releasing hormone, thyrotropin, sorry about that, thyrotropin releasing hormone, corticotropin releasing hormone, prolactin inhibiting hormone, which in this case secretly is dopamine, and growth hormone, releasing hormone, and somatostatin. And the word statin means stop, quit, don't do it anymore. So statin. These are going to go down here, and if you are, say, you're secreting from the hypothalamus gonadotropin releasing hormone, it's going to go down, and it's going to tell this lobe of the pituitary to release follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Now this is going to have a different effect in men as it is in women because in women we have follicles and they have eggs in the follicle and so this is going to tell us to release an egg. But guys don't release eggs but hey they do release other stuff. So in them this is going to act on their sperm formation. So the follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone have a slightly different effect in males and females. But because we consider our ovaries as a, as a gonad and we consider our testicles as gonads, then this is gonadotropin-releasing hormone. And it's both hormones. They're both stimulated at the same time with the same hormone. Thyrotropin-releasing hormone going to come down here and tell it to release thyroid stimulating hormone or thyrotropin. And if you go to the doctor, a lot of times they'll do a TSH and that's what they're looking. They're looking to see how much thyroid stimulating hormone that you're making to see if your thyroid's working correctly. Because a lot of the problems that people have is because their thyroid is either overactive or underactive. So you have the hypothalamus saying, hey, release it, release it. So it comes down the portal system, and it says, okay, I'm releasing the thyroid-stimulating hormone. It's going to go out into the bloodstream throughout the body, but where the receptors are for thyroid-stimulating hormone is the thyroid, and then the thyroid will release thyroid hormone. So you have this elaborate thing of the hypothalamus deciding that you need it, telling the hypothalamus, excuse me, the uh, adenohypophysis or the front part of the, of the pituitary to release this stimulating hormone, which then goes on to the thyroid. So this is why some people are like, oh, wow, that is so complicated. that they, they just kind of shut off. It's like, mm, this is almost like math. It's too hard. I can't learn it. So get over it. Get over it. Make a card. If that helps you, make a, a little card. Write down, hypothalamus makes thyrotropin releasing hormone, which is TRH for short, which goes down to the anterior pituitary, which releases TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, which then goes down to the thyroid, and it's going to release T3, T4. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the thyroid. All right, and then you have prolactin, 
And I mentioned earlier that prolactin, the most famous thing that it does is it causes women to make milk. But we have prolactin at all times, so it has a lot of other functions in your body besides just making milk. But in almost every textbook I've looked at, unless you're taking a whole course in just endocrinology, you can take a whole course just studying hormones. So, And if you get the opportunity, I highly suggest you do it because it's fascinating what all is going on in your body. But anyway, we're trying to crunch a whole semester into one chapter. So we're, we're not going to go into all the things that all the hormones can do. And I bet you, if you think really hard, you can figure out what growth hormone, releasing hormone, coming out of the hypothalamus is going to do. And this, by the way, is abbreviated GHRH. So if you're reading along, you're going, what the heck is GHRH? It's growth hormone, releasing hormone. So it's going to go down here and say, release growth hormone. There you go. And maybe you don't want to have too much growth hormone, you want to shut it off, then you can release somatostatin. Stop it. Thyroid hormone is one of those hormones that works on the whole body. It controls metabolism. It has so many functions in the body. When you're born, if your thyroid gland is not working correctly, if you're not making thyroid hormone, or maybe that whole pathway from the hypothalamus to the pituitary to the um, thyroid gland is broken in some way, if you do not release thyroid hormone, your brain will not develop. And children, before they started testing, for the uh, absence or not having enough thyroid hormone ended up being what we call cretins. And so that used to be a thing. I don't think I've heard anybody use that word in a long time, but it was a really a negative thing. If you said, oh my gosh, you are such a cretin, uh, that would mean a, a person who literally had no ability to think. So now... A lot of times when a baby is born, they check to see that their thyroid is working correctly because this is preventable. This child, had they gotten thyroid hormone from the time they were born, they would have been fine. But because they didn't, the brain didn't develop. So this is an example of cretinism. If you make too much thyroid hormone, you can end up with what we call Graves' disease, and you lay down fat behind your eyes, and it actually causes your eyes to bug out. So, exothalamus is this condition. There was a famous actor who made his living because his eyes bugged out like that. You can usually tell if someone's making too much thyroid hormone because they get a goiter. They're, they get a swelling of the thyroid gland. But this can also be a symptom of not enough thyroid hormone. So you keep getting the signal coming from the hypothalamus to the pituitary and on down to the thyroid gland saying, hey, we need thyroid. And the thyroid gland grows bigger and bigger and bigger trying to make thyroid hormone, but it can't make it for you. So you can get a goiter if you have too much thyroid, and you can get a goiter if you don't have enough. But it's kind of unmistakable. It kind of seems like you'd notice that you had a goiter before it got bigger than this, or as big as this. Now we're going to talk about the neurohypothesis or the posterior pituitary. And it is actually just a wad of nervous tissue. It is not a gland, actually. And the hormones that are made are made in the hypothalamus. And they come down the stalk, down into the back part of the pituitary. And they're held there until they're released into the bloodstream. And the two main hormones that we're going to be talking about that come out of there are oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. 
Now remember, antidiuretic hormone was the the uh, chemical that the people who were looking at blood pressure were studying, and they were calling it vasopressin, and then come to find out it's the same exact same chemical, just released somewhere else and having a slightly different effect. Now, oxytocin, probably one of my favorite hormones. It is called the love hormone, the love hormone, because it is the hormone that you release that makes you bond to someone. So sometimes when you feel like you're in love, you're just you're just secreting oxytocin. So one of the things they used to do is they would pay people that were supposedly witches or alchemists to make a concoction, to make some sort of an elixir, a love potion. And actually, had they known about it, a little oxytocin would have done the trick. So oxytocin, we're going to uh, discover at different levels, cause different things to happen. So at low levels, for a pregnant woman, or it's not a pregnant woman, but a woman who's just given birth, it will cause her milk to let down. So the prolactin causes her to make milk, but then you have to have something that causes the milk to be released. And so oxytocin does that. And one of the reasons that they call it the love hormone, because it is what uh, causes you to have an orgasm. So that we, we kind of like that um, to happen. And then uh, the other thing that you can do with oxytocin, if you have a really high level of it, a very, very high level of it, it will cause you to give birth. So depending on which level of oxytocin, you're either going to bond with someone and have that feel-good feeling like, oh, I really love you. You know, you have it towards your baby, you have it towards your sisters and brothers and your parents and your grandparents. And a lot of that is oxytocin talking. And then again, as I said, you can have an orgasm or you can have a baby if you have a really high level. And so doctors discovered this. When I had my first baby, I had it out in the boonie part of Mississippi, very backwoodsy part, um, Water Valley. And the doctor wanted to plow that weekend. And so he took any of the women that he had that were anywhere near delivery, and he put us all in the hospital, and he put us on an oxytocin drip which they call a Pitocin drip, and it caused us to go into labor, and we all delivered our babies on Friday, so he didn't have to worry about being called out of his fields on Saturday or Sunday to have to deliver a baby. This slide says that there's eight hormones produced in the hypothalamus, six to regulate the anterior pituitary, and two that are released into uh, the capillaries. This word should be from the posterior, posterior pituitary. Okay, but anyway, be that as it may. Uh, the six releasing and inhibiting hormones are TRH, CRH, GNRH. So remember that's the RH is releasing hormone, thyroid. corticotropin-releasing hormone, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, growth hormone-releasing hormone. And it tells you that they tell the anterior pituitary to release thyroid-stimulating hormone, prolactin, adrenocorticotropic hormone, which we haven't talked about at all, FSH, LH, and GH. And the prolactin-inhibiting uh, hormone is dopamine, and it stops you from releasing prolactin, and somatostatin stops both growth hormone and thyroid-stimulating hormone, because both of those have to do with the metabolism rate of your body. So somato means body, statin, stop. So stop the growth hormone, stop the thyroid hormone. So let's talk about adrenocorticotropic hormone. And 
There is a disease called Cushing's disease where you hypersecrete this and you grow so fast that your skin can't stretch well enough and so you get what they call stretch marks. So someone who has a lot of abdominal fat and a lot of stretch marks, you might test them to see if they have Cushing's disease, if they're over-secreting. This woman had a tumor where she hypersecreted uh, ACTH. And you can see the stretch marks, you can see the swollen belly, but you notice the arms are fairly normal and the legs are fairly normal, or actually in this case, actually smaller than normal. And this huge moon face, the big swollen moon face. So here she is in this direction. So you can see the moon shaped face that does not go with the rest of the body. So you get the belly and the face. And when they removed the tumor that was making too much ACTH, she ended up looking fairly normal, although her hairstyle is a little different than what we have nowadays. ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, if you take those words, each one, adreno means it's going to act on the adrenal gland. Remember the thing that looks like a little wad of chewing gum that somebody stuck on top of your kidney? Cortico is the outside. So the adrenal gland, when we get down into it, we're going to find that it has the outer part, the cork or the cortex, and the inner, which is the medulla or the middle part. And they each have different hormones that they make. So this is adrenocorticotropic hormone. Tropic means stimulating. So this is going to stimulate the outside of the adrenal gland to release stress hormones. And when you make stress hormones, you make too much cortisol, hydrocortisone, things like that, then you're going to have this moon face and you're going to have this belly. A lot of times you're going to end up with a big bulge of fat on your back too, or up here on your neck even. So this slide is just emphasizing the fact that the posterior pituitary releases ADH. It releases oxytocin, but it doesn't make them. They're made up in the hypothalamus, and then they come down and are stored back in the posterior part of the pituitary. This slide is just emphasizing the fact that the anterior pituitary is more glandular and the posterior pituitary, or the neural hypothesis, is nerve endings. So you see myelinated uh, sheaths, and you see hormones being stored. So clearly two completely different tissue types, because one is glandular and one is uh, uh, the ends of neurons. I remember a long time ago studying the follicle-stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone. And since they're both co-released, they're both released at the same time, it was kind of hard to figure out which one was doing what. But they finally sorted it out. The follicle-stimulating hormone causes the ovaries to secrete the sex hormones, and the luteinizing hormone causes the testicles to secrete testosterone. So that's kind of an interesting thing. In the case of a woman, once she releases an egg, if she gets pregnant, then the sac, the corpus luteum, and we'll study this when we talk about uh, male and female reproduction and stuff like that, but she will have the sac that the egg was stored in in the ovary that will persist and it will secrete progesterone and allow her to maintain the pregnancy. If she didn't get pregnant, then the corpus luteum just literally shrivels up, goes away, and she stops making the progesterone from it. So that's something that women do that guys don't do because they don't have a corpus luteum. They just have the um, uh, sperm production and the testosterone going on in theirs and women have other things besides just having an egg and estrogen. 
So we, we have the progesterone that's important also and the corpus luteum, which is important. And we tend to go in waves of hormones and guys tend to be more, uh, uh, not, not as severe and drastic of waves of making a lot, not making a lot. They tend to be a little bit more consistent. Your book only talks about six of the hormones that are made by the anterior pituitary. So we've talked about the thyroid uh, stimulating hormone, and we talked about the follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And here's the other three that they want you to know. The ACTH, which stimulates the cortex of the adrenal gland and makes it release glucocorticoids. So the glucocorticoids and mineral corticoids all come out of the um, uh, adrenal glands. The gluco, when you see that, that looks so much like the word glucose. And that's because it does have to do with that. So it, it controls how you handle sugars, glucocorticoids. But you need, you need to regulate that when you're stressed out. So we usually think of the stress hormones. When you think of the adrenal gland, think of stress. Just kind of adrenal stress. Or adrenaline, stress, a bear, I'm scared. All right, prolactin, I told you. They never talk about all the cool stuff that prolactin does. They always just says, it makes you make milk if you're a female. And then the growth hormone, it stimulates mitosis and cellular differentiation. So you really, really need the growth hormone. And one of the things that, that's kind of sad as you get old is you stop making very much growth hormone, and then you get all weird and wrinkly looking. So it it's one of the things, anytime you turn on your computer, it goes, hey, you want to see what people look like now that used to be really, really pretty? And you go, yeah, I can't wait to see. And you click on it, and you're like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness, because they were so beautiful. And my goodness, look at them when they're in their 70s and 80s. Blah. With the exception of Betty White, who just goes on looking gorgeous always. All right, so here's a picture showing who all is talking to whom. So the hypothalamus is talking to the pituitary. The pituitary then is talking, in the case of prolactin, to the breast, uh, thyroid, thyroid stimulating hormone to the thyroid, luteinizing and follicle stimulating hormone to the testicles and the ovaries, ACTH to the outside of the adrenal gland, and your growth hormone, it's going to go over to the liver and cause it to make another uh, growth factor, growth factor. And it also is going to act directly on your muscles. So instead of being all uh, where your muscles are all weak, you don't usually see a whole lot of old people lifting a lot of heavy stuff because their muscles are wasting away because they don't have enough growth hormone. Uh, this is a summary slide that tells you what I told you about the posterior pituitary hormones. An antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin, because it causes vasoconstriction, which causes your blood pressure to shoot up. It also increases water retention, so you don't pee as much. And it prevents you from dehydrating. And it also causes your blood pressure to go up because you are holding water. So if you've got more fluid, you've got more pressure in your blood vessels. So two different names, seemingly two different functions. But if you follow it to the vasoconstriction, keeping water in your body, it makes a little bit more sense. Here's the slide talking about oxytocin. But I do want to I do want to point out something. So if you have a little bit of oxytocin causes the milk to come out when you when you're nursing when you're about to nurse your baby or you have more oxytocin which causes orgasm. The if you put two and two together if you are breastfeeding your baby and you have a sexual encounter that results in an orgasm, you will squirt your partner with milk.
One more interesting thing about oxytocin is that it is one of the few hormones that works with positive feedback rather than negative feedback. So a lot of times, for example, thyroid hormone. If you have too much thyroid hormone, it actually goes back and tells the hypothalamus to quit stimulating so that you stop making too much thyroid hormone. So it actually feeds back and shuts off the process. But in the case of oxytocin, it will actually keep on increasing and increasing and increasing. So the baby suckling on the mother to get milk will actually send more message to make more oxytocin to cause more milk to come down. And it'll only stop when the baby stops nursing. And in the case of childbirth, you just keep making more oxytocin and you've got the stretching and the baby coming out. And so you're making more oxytocin and more oxytocin until the baby is released and it's left the body. And now you don't have the stimulus to make more oxytocin. So it shuts off. So it is a positive feedback. It just keeps going, going, going until there's an event like the baby stops nursing or you give birth that'll stop it. So here's a nice little slide that says what I just said, but they say it much more succinctly than I did. Negative feedback is where you have enough thyroid hormone, so it will actually go back and stop the uh, hypothalamus from making TRH and stop the anterior pituitary from making thyroid stimulating hormone. So here's a nice little picture showing you the thyroid hormone. Releasing hormone makes the thyroid stimulating hormone, which causes the thyroid hormone to be made, and the thyroid hormone goes out and does what thyroid hormone does, but it also feeds back and says, okay, enough, enough, stop it. And there's the slide talking about the positive feedback. Stretching of the uterus causes oxytocin to be released, which causes contractions, which causes stretching of the uterus, which causes more oxytocin to be released, and so on until you finally deliver the baby. This slide has a lot of stuff on it, so let's see if we can plow through this. Okay, growth hormone acts on cartilage and bone, so you're going to grow you're going to have strong bones. You need cartilage. That would be your tendons and your ligaments. So you need that. It's going to make nice, strong muscles and hopefully keep you from making too much fat. So you're growing. You're using the energy for muscles and bones and cartilage instead of storing it up as fat. So growth hormone is, is a good thing. And it's kind of a, a debate, debatable thing right now because people didn't used to live this long. The, in 1900, the average life expectancy was about 46. So we didn't have a lot of old people. And now we have lots of old people, lots and lots of them. And as you get older, you stop making very much growth hormone. You stop making thyroid hormone. You stop making estrogen. You stop making testosterone. So you slowly make less and less and less. And so in your uh, medical books, it goes, this is normal not to have hormones. And I'm thinking, no, it's not. Because if you can't make insulin, then you take insulin shots. If you don't have enough thyroid hormone, they give you thyroid hormone. So you can actually take Synthroid or Levothyroxine, as it's sometimes called. So why did they decide that old people should not have growth hormone, should not have testosterone, should not have estrogen? I just find this the oddest thing. But it's probably because they're not old. And then by the time they got old enough to realize, oh, heck, it is too late to write textbooks or to rewrite the textbooks. But anyway something to think about because we have growth hormone is very easy to make to grow so it wouldn't cost that much to give it to people 
The other thing growth hormone does besides act on the bones and making you grow to your normal height, it will uh, make the liver make that insulin-like growth factor that we were talking about. Some people call them somatomedins. And they stimulate the target cells throughout the body. So it causes the growth hormone to act longer. So it keeps it from being degraded. And so you get more bang for your buck. And growth hormone, once you release it, remember it comes from the anterior pituitary or the adenohypophysis, it lasts anywhere from 6 to 20 minutes. But the IGF lasts about 20 hours. So it can help protect or prolong the half-life of the growth hormone because it's around longer. Interestingly enough, for just about any chemical that's in your body, there's a book that will tell you the half-life of that chemical. So you can look up the half-life of cocaine, you can look up the half-life of growth hormone, the half-life of pretty much anything you can think of. How long will it stay in the body before it's degraded? So those vitamins and minerals that you take, how long do they last in your body before they're either degraded or, or released in your urine to get rid of it? So half-life is how long it takes for half of a substance to go away. So I think most people know the, about the half-life of liquor. So, you know, if you have like a shot glass of liquor, then within an hour, your body will have cleared it. So you will have gone through enough half-lives that you could pass a sobriety test. So half-life, how long something persists in the body until half of it is gone. All right. So some more fun stuff to know about growth hormone. If you take growth hormone, it will increase your protein synthesis. So that's, that's the whole thing. If you remember what uh, protein synthesis involves, you've got to make the messenger RNA. You've got to go out to the ribosome and use a transfer RNA to bring the amino acids. So you got all of that stuff. And your lipid metabolism increases. So the word catabolize means to tear down. And if you forget what that means, just look at the word cat and think of all the things that a cat will destroy in your house. And you're like, cat, oh, whoa, destroying. So how cool would that be to stimulate your fat cells to break down the fat, to get rid of the fat in your body? So as you look at old people, they tend to get usually fatter and fatter and fatter. And they're like, nobody makes a connection that you stop making growth hormone and you start getting fat. It's like, huh, wow, okay. But if you go to an endocrinologist, a lot of them just want to work with diabetes because that's where the money is. This other stuff is complicated. You got to figure out why is your thyroid not working? Is it because you're not making stimulating hormone? You're not having releasing hormone? Or you don't have the receptors that are acting? So you're making the thyroid hormone, but it's not acting correctly once it gets to the receptors. So it's just complicated. So it's just easier. Diabetes is forever. So, But we'll talk about that in the second half of this particular chapter because now we know that at least type 2 diabetes is not forever, which is great news, but more about that later. All right. The other thing that the growth hormone does, it helps you with your electrolyte balance. So it helps you keep from peeing out your sodium and your potassium, and it helps you absorb calcium. So we when you did the nervous system, I hope you learned all about calcium and sodium and potassium. When you talked about the brain, you should have talked about sodium, potassium, and calcium. And when you talked about the heart, you should have talked about it again. So you should realize how incredibly important those particular ions are, and you've got to have them or your body will not work. Of course, you don't want too much, 
But we don't worry about the calcium usually because we have hormones that, that cause us to keep the right amount of calcium. But you can't store potassium. So if you can't regulate the potassium that you bring into your body and you pee it out without being able to keep it, then you're going to have all sorts of neurological problems and you're going to have uh, muscle problems. So usually when you start having leg cramps or twitches, you're low on potassium. That's kind of a, kind of a rule of thumb. A long time ago, I was a reviewer for this, your author's first book. And I was uh, hired to look for mistakes that were in the book. And now he's all the way to his ninth edition. And he is a lot older. And I find it interesting that he's spending a lot of time when he's making these slides and talking in the chapter about what it's like to grow old and what happens. So growth hormone at age 30, your body is about 10% bone, 30% muscle, and 20% fat. By the time you're 75, you have lost quite a bit of your bone. You have lost half of your muscles and you have converted uh, tissue to double the fat. So, and all of this can be traced back to the fact that your, your uh, growth hormone levels have declined. Now, one of the things, now that we have so many old people, we're starting to study them. And here's a new hormone that they discovered called ghrelin, which is released by your empty stomach. So interestingly enough, if you are hungry, not to the point where you're, you're ill, you know, where you're actually digesting your own body, that's, that's not good, but we eat way too much food, incredibly way too much food. If you sit down and, and look at what 120 calories looks like, you're like, uh, that doesn't even make a whole meal. That's not even enough food to make a whole meal. And that's what you're supposed to have an entire day. So we go way beyond that. So if, when your stomach is empty, you're going to be releasing this hormone and it is going to stimulate growth hormone. Another way that you can artificially, or not artificially, but, but get a little bit more growth hormone is to vigorously exercise. And most of us uh, older people are not really into vigorous exercise. So that's not one of the ways that we're going to get some growth hormone. You secrete a lot of growth hormone your first two hours of sleep. So old people have trouble sleeping too. So uh, there's a lot of reasons why our growth hormone goes down. But anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out there because one of these days you guys are going to get older. All right, so we're going to stop now and I'm going to come back and finish up the chapter in another lecture. So uh, be thinking about the pituitary and the hypothalamus and how they talk to each other and then how the hormones go out into the bloodstream and talk to the various organs.